Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 205 for Monday, March 25th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsored by Band Zoogle, a new sponsor for us. We'll talk about how you can use promo code Gig Gab to get 15% off your first year a little bit later here back in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you doing today, Mr. Kent? Quite good, Mr. Hamilton. It's, it's a Monday. These are not musicians' hours we're keeping today. Uh, it's, it's true. I, uh, especially not for you because you're three hours behind me and, and we're doing this first thing in the morning for you. So thank you for flexing to my schedule. I appreciate it. I hope I'm uh, somewhat intelligent today. <laughs> you're intelligent every day. <laughs> not, not this hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just fogging through getting ready for the week, but, uh, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah. Uh, life's been crazy. You know, I uh, obviously was at South by Southwest the last time we we talked. Actually, the last time we talked, I, we you and I haven't even spoken offline since uh, since then. But uh, yeah. but yeah, things are good. You know, crazy it's, uh, as always. But that's how life is prepping for Madhouse this week, which is always it's these we we now are in the schedule of monthly Madhouses, which really is like just almost too frequent for for my life it's not like it's managed a lot of prep yeah yeah it's it's um i mean for a and, bunch of one-offs yeah for a bunch of one-offs yeah exactly exactly it's just like oh right we're doing this again okay here you we go you haven't been speaking too much about uh, uptown and about fling lately are, the, hmm. are your bands still going yeah so we have uh we actually have quite a few uptown gigs coming up uh yeah obviously all private stuff because that's what that band does but um but yeah in fact we had a rehearsal last week and um it it actually went really well it was the first rehearsal since i joined the band that i felt like we were like all coming into the rehearsal as as equals it, at least in terms of i it wasn't getting dave up to speed because we don't rehearse that much with that band you know it was it was just kind of you know i just sort of joined as the train was like barreling down the tracks but um, but we had a little time right now and and we added uh, five or six new songs for us. And so we were all coming into them. Most of the songs were new to all of us, which was, you know, kind of which was a good thing that in that sense, equal. Right. You know, and sort of sniffing our way through them together and, um, you know, working on the arrangements together and all that stuff. So, yeah, some fun stuff. We we added uh, Jet Airliner mm -hmm. from Steve Miller. Yep, yeah. You you guys play that? Yeah, that's a fun one. That's a that's an interesting tune in terms of the groove. It it is much slower. I'm I'm finding and I I think as a band collectively we found this, but it's 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 much slower than you want it to be or think it should be. You, you know, you hear that that riff and it it really kind of sits back in a pocket. Uh, it does. Yeah. We take like many things in our group, we take it from live versions to kind of mm -hmm. see how, how these things are reinterpreted. Yeah. Added a really fun horn chart to it that makes it pop. And, and, uh, people really, really, they love singing along to that song. It's a sing. Steve Miller is the king of the sing along, man. <laughs> and that, you know, I, I, I came to that conclusion the other night as we were doing this. I'm like, everybody's going to be singing along. I'm like, wait a minute. When in, uh, in, in Monkey Fist, you know, we end, our default final song is the Joker because everybody wants to sing along, it, you know, and it's just like, man, and it's, they're upbeat and they're happy little, the dude knows how to write a melody. Let's put it this way. <laughs> yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. I'd say the two kind of eighties ish classic rock things that have been going great for us are, are jet airliner. Yeah. And, uh, uh, crumbling down by John Mellencamp. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. 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 People really like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, we also added um, Mama Don't Dance, which is a song that uh, surprisingly not one of us has played before. I, I don't even know how that's possible. This is this is not the Loggins and Messina yeah. song. It is? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yep. I've never played it before. They've never, nobody had ever played it before. So we had a fun time going through it. And as we talked about on the show, you know, I had just watched that episode with Kenny Loggins on uh, Daryl's house 
And mm-hmm. so he had he had talked through some of the, you know, more uh, nuanced parts of, of the tune. So it was like, oh, cool. We can kind of add some of that stuff in real easy. We don't even have to think about it. So, yeah, it's a nice tune and, you know, fun with the harmonies and yeah. uh, and the little breaks and stops. And I think people will love it. Uh, have so you ever played this it? rehearsal is, is, a, is a, I've never played that. Oh, actually, I think I played it in Acoustic Madness. Um, mm. But uh, th- this rehearsal that you're going to is to support putting a few new songs in place that was last week's rehearsal yeah then we've we've got three or four rehearsals before our our string of gigs coming up and so the first one was just to go through these new tunes and then uh we will kind of dig back into the existing catalog in the next couple of rehearsals and and polish through those things and you you know make sure they're all up to snuff and get the transitions right so with the house rockers i have been thinking we have a lot of songs right yeah and we have songs that either we're never going to fail because they're great songs or songs that just work for us that, that have become good staple songs for us. And I actually, my, you know, my, my constant pendulum of, of thinking about putting together set lists, especially as we're getting ready to become more of a, of a corporate leading band and do a little bit less um, public shows. Sure. I start wondering about, you know, really, is it better to, you know, basically have, 80% of your show the same every night, 20% just to keep the band. And, you know, those, those yeah. few people who do come to see you more than often and just, you know, just go to work, you know, just, just do your business. And, uh, cause the stuff that we, the stuff that is in that 80% just kills list yep. is, uh, you know, it, it's been killing for our band for a long, 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 long time. I mean, you know, you pull this stuff out and it just works and it works and it works and it works, never doesn't work. That's that's correct. It never doesn't work. Well, it's it's yeah. When you're doing, I think and certainly Uptown does this. We we might change the order of the set list to a degree. I mean, there's some songs that that we have that link together as segues or or medleys ish. And so obviously we don't change those orders, but uh, but we will place them differently. Gary, Gary writes all the set lists and, and that's fine. Nobody else needs to be involved. He does a fine job with it. He understands flow and pacing and all of that stuff. So like it just works. But, you know, to your point, it just works because every song on its own just works. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, it, uh, we, we will wind up playing the same set, especially if we've got gigs two weeks in a row or whatever. It's just like, yeah, just go play the same show. It's really what it comes down to is, is, you know, we're just going out, we're doing a show, but there's the only people that are the same are us. Right. And our, obviously our, our sound guy, Dave, but, um, you know, the, the crowds are 100% different from gig to gig. So we don't have to worry about, you know, people feeling like they're, they're, uh, you know, getting bored or whatever. It's just like, no, we're going and putting on our best show here. And then next week we'll go put on our best show there. And yes. unless something was a train wreck here, there we'll get the same show, you know, it so. just strikes me as interesting as we're going through the season of the year where we try to add some, some new material. Yeah. And um, I get, for some reason this year, I'm just kind of more keenly aware that I'm asking is it not, not, you know, usually you bring a song into your band, you're excited about it in your mind's eye. You can see it, you know, killing on stage and people thinking you're the smartest thing ever. But um, I, I'm really asking myself, is this as good as the stuff that we have in mm. just about so many things that we that, that we're bringing in? Ah, uh, yeah. OK, so the reason we started adding songs, I think we probably would have stuck with the same set list and song list. We, we've always had by and large, you know, there's some songs we do, we have more than we need at any given gig. But but, you know, the, the song list is pretty, uh, pretty solid. We added a bunch because we thought we were going to wind up doing some at least one, if not more of these gigs without a female singer. And so that required us to sort of look at things and analyze and be like, OK, we need to, you know, we need to solve that problem without having a woman, you know, vocalist. OK, how yeah. are we going to do that? And it turns out, no, we we are able to have um, our our singer, Kelly, who's been with the band, I think, since the beginning, wound up moving out of state. And we knew we all knew this was coming, you know, her her life sort of, you know, progressing along and and. uh she and her husband were wind up moving. I think they, you know, they became empty, empty nesters and they moved, I don't know, three hours away or something. So she, she's done with the band, but, uh, this other woman, Rachel, who f- actually filled in at my first gig with this band is fantastic. 
And uh, and we were able to get her for all three of these. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So so she's not been extended a formal invitation to join the band. She's a sub still. Uh, you know, I don't know what the deal is with her and Gary. I think um, I think in terms of I don't I don't even I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't I have no idea. You know what? Dave bang drum. Dave shows up. Dave bang drum. <laughs> Dave goes home. <laughs> so but I'm glad to have her for for all three of these. I mean, even that first gig that I I played, she she, you know, fit right in. I think she had done some gigs with with this band before and our keyboard player and her played in another band for years and years. So so there's definitely, you know, she's she's a not only a known quantity, but but comfortable with everybody. And uh, mm-hmm. so, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all it's all good. I'm actually really looking forward to it. I was a little little concerned about doing, especially like, a. I think one of the gigs was a wedding and it was like, guys, I don't know that we should do this without a female singer. <laughs> so, uh-huh. yeah. So, so we, we won't, which is good. Yep. Yeah. I find that the struggle with new material is kind of interesting. There's so many songs. There's so many great, great songs. And then you parse your approach to it in a few different ways. Like, what does your band need? Where are the holes in your repertoire? Yeah. Do you yeah. continue to do you continue to you know backfill the styles of music that you're really strong in? Do you strive for as much diversity? I, I you know I'm finding I really like what happens when you play newer stuff, and not just newer, you know, like top forty Bruno Mars stuff, mm. but even you know some of the some of the pop rock stuff that was popular. You know, I'm. I'm you know, Fountains of Wayne, Bowling for Soup, you know, some of that stuff, sure. you know, because some of the people who grew up with that stuff, it's it's popular enough that it turns a real light bulb on, but then it's popular enough. Are we, is that the bar is that, that we're setting? Is that the bar? Enough? Right. Yeah. Good enough. Popular enough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, if it's you're. It's interesting that you went all the way back to Mama Don't Dance. I mean, that's a really old song. It is. Right. And of all the songs, how did you end up in that one? Someone just said, hey, this might be good and people will get it and they'll remember it. They'll get it. I mean, I would say if you're under 40, you're, you don't know that song. I mean, that it hasn't been on the radio. You mm. know, it hasn't been in a movie. I don't, I don't think anybody would get that. Totally true. Yeah. I, I, I have no idea. I'm not part of that. Dave Bang Drum. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we played it well. And, and that's also part of it. Right. I mean, you, you know, uh, having a good song certainly. Well, helps. Let, let, can, let, let me spend this on you. If you. Uh, we're suddenly handed the keys to Uptown and, you know, all, all, uh, repertoire decisions were in your hands. What would you do with a, with a spooning in of new material? And this is not a, a, and this is not a, this is not a, uh, offering an opportunity to complain about Uptown. I'm saying if you had any corporate band, any private event band, what would you do? Would you, would you evaluate the talent you have and find this best stuff? Would you only have picked musicians that can play anything you put in front of them? Would you, would you, you know, lean as lean as current and modern as possible? Um, would you lean as, you know, tried and true as possible? Yeah. I'd, I'd go with, you know, nothing that didn't hit the, for a band like that, you know, you're playing cover tunes. The entire point is just to entertain. You're not there to be clever you know, you're, not, you're like nothing of the sort is part of it. You're getting paid far more than, you know, you would at a club gig or whatever. You are there to to fill a, a, you know, a need and keep people happy and dancing and all that good stuff. So I would look for stuff that was, you know, in the in the top 10, anything not in the top 10 and maybe top even 10 top, at, at any time. Right. I mean, right. if it wasn't if it never was in the top 10, it, it, it like there's no reason to put it on the list. So. Like that's number one. And, uh, and I, I think I would space, space it knowing it's speaking specifically about uptown, knowing the types of crowds that we play for, um, I, I would spread it out from things like, you know, I, I would go back, you know, 50 years. Um, and, but also stuff for today. Like I, I would, mm-hmm. I would span the entirety of it. Uh, given the types of gigs that we currently get now, if the decision was made to, okay, we want to focus on, you know, something different. Well, then obviously, okay. Now maybe we get rid of stuff that anything that's more than 20 years old, like has to have been a number one and still somehow in the, you know, in the, in the, the, the current active lexicon of music that people might hear, you know, and know that kind of thing. So, yeah. So would mama don't dance fit? I don't probably not. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's, 
that's one of those tunes that fun song. It's fun, fun feeling song. Yeah. And it was remade. Um, who re- I mean, it's been remade a million times. Right. But I, I, I feel. Yeah. And this might be my perspective because I because I wasn't really thinking about any of these decisions until you asked. Right. It was just like, oh, go learn. You said top 10, or, which top 10 billboard top 10. Got it. Yeah. But, but isn't there isn't there. 20 different variants of billboard, like would, would country, it, like the, the hottest country song, would that make it into? Uh, yeah. I would actually have some country two. stuff in the list yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 Mm. Country stuff is actually fun to play, especially it for really a, is. a crowd of people that are up and dancing and it and really is. It. Yep. Yep. So, mm. so yeah, but I don't have the keys and I'm happy that way. Dave bang drum. See, you know, where I live, um, the corporate gigs, you know, all the big tech companies that are out here in Silicon Valley, your audience is largely under 40, largely Ooh. under 40. Right. Right. So that's, a, that's a given for corporate gigs. Um, and of, of course, wedding gigs is going to be largely under 40 as well. Right. Well, the, no, because you've got the oh, that that's actually one of the things I'm thinking about with Uptown. I mean, you you have the the younger set, right, of the the friends and and such of the bride and groom typically, you know, uh, that that's going to be in your, you know, late twenties, early thirties kind of, you know, that's the sweet spot for that right there. But then you've got all the relatives that are now, Mm. you you know, 20 years older than that or plus. So, so yeah, you kind of have to do the whole thing because people at weddings love to see their parents like cutting loose. Right. And so you have to kind of, you got to serve both sides. And I think, I think that's where a tune like mama don't dance probably fits really well, but jet, but jet airliner gets everybody and that's cool. (laughs) Or could, you know, probably will. So we added a a hall and oats tune too. Uh, I can't go for that. Yeah, that's that. That might be the killer groove of all killer grooves. It's so We've true. been playing that for so long. <laughs> yeah. And it works. And it's, you know, even though it's kind of slower, mm-hmm. it just grooves and grinds. And it's, you know, that that is a that might that my dance grooves of all time. I, I agree. Yeah, that's a fantastic tune. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to ask you some more questions about South by. Did you see any other bands that you were, you know, we talked a lot about the one band that you saw, but um, yeah, did I, you see any other bands that you like? I do. I want to talk about a, a bunch of other bands because I only saw one cover band. And of course that was basically the only band we talked about last episode was, um, was Mr. Jimmy. But, right. uh, and I saw, and I saw Red Volkert and Bill Kirshner and we talked about them too. And, and that, that's definitely not. That well, was they, more like cultural, cultural experience of Austin, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, um, but yeah, I saw a bunch of other bands. I want to take a, so we'll talk about those. But first, I want to take a quick minute and talk about our sponsor for this episode, which is a new sponsor for us. And that is Banzoogle. So uh, Banzoogle, for those of you that don't know and you want to know, like it couldn't be more perfectly targeted to you. Banzoogle is an, like all in one platform that makes it super easy to build a great looking website for your band, your music, your solo career, whatever it is. They are they they've created this engine that allows you to build and host your website right there. One stop. You're good to go. And and they power websites for tens of thousands of musicians around the world from weekend warriors to Grammy winners to perhaps the most important one, the house rockers, right? Uh, <laughs> that um, is the most important. One. That is. And, and I want to hear about this from you, Paul, because Banzoogle, they have like, you can use your own custom domain name. They have templates that you can use. Right. And then, and then they have tools to sell your music and merch right there. And yeah, mailing list tools and social media integration, right? Tell us about, tell us about this. And then we'll tell us, tell everybody about how they can get a, a good deal. So absolutely. So uh, yes, I'm a Banzoogle user, a really happy Banzoogle user. I found their site when I was looking to, you know, finally take my website, my house rockers website out of the domain of, you know, someone hosted it. I had someone else, a series of people help me, um, help me design it and, you know, make changes to it. And then, you know, as the world has gone on and, and, you know, more modern sites and this thing called WordPress, which is a, you know, technology and a bunch of, a uh, bunch of templates, you know, became, uh, became powerful. Your site, my site quickly looked dated. It had sure. the essential sure. stuff there, but it really looked dated. And uh, so I, it was time for me to move and I came across Banzoogle and I, you know, checked them out, you know, talked to a few people who use them, looked at the site and, you know, they have a bunch of stuff that lets you kind of try it. 
you know, you can build a site on your own. And that's kind of the key here. Anybody really can build a site on their own. It's really very drag and drop oriented, very, um, um, uh, you know, simple to add some pretty complex things um, to a site, you know, things like things like slideshows, you know, add things like um, calendars that contain oh, enough information yeah. to really be useful, not only like where and when a, an event is, but if there's any, you know, if you're selling tickets to an event and actually they actually have a back end service where you can actually sell uh, merchandise and tickets to them as well. They really understand bands and music and uh, they've come up with a business model that really works. So first thing is you see, you go to the site and you see dozens of beautiful templates. I mean, you know, it's, it's almost hard to choose between them because one looks better than the other. And, you know, they're, they're so modern, you know, the layout is, is so, is so thoroughly modern and includes all the features, you know, motion graphics and, you know, slight animations and, you know, the, the way that the, the site um, loads and your logo can spin up and, you know, just a, a bunch of just very subtle things that give a polish to your site that, you know, you wouldn't be able to do if you're not uh, you're truly a web designer. So the templates are absolutely gorgeous. That's awesome. All right. Yeah, I, really I, I, I know. And I know you could talk forever about this, but I also know that people want to know how they can get started. So plans start at just eight twenty nine a month. That's eight dollars and twenty nine cents, which includes the hosting and your own free custom domain name. So you go to bandzoogle.com, start your 30 day free trial and make sure you use the promo code GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription you pick, right? So that's banzoogle.com. The promo code is GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B. That obviously lets them know that we sent you, but it also gets you that 15% off. So well worth it. You can start building your website today. And uh, we'll have more to say about Banzoogle. Uh, yes, the, absolutely. Every yeah. week. Yeah, yeah. House Rockers endorsed. That's what I want people to know. There you go. Sweet. And our thanks to, uh, to Banzoogle for sponsoring the episode. All right, man. Yeah, you. So, yeah, you hit it. I saw uh, I think I saw 25 bands in in four days. Yeah. At, at South by Southwest. And, you know, it, I go and see these bands and they're largely bands I've never heard of. Um, you know, I'll I'll find them. I, I'm on the press list, so I get uh, press releases and I, you know, sometimes those sort of catch my eye. Other times I'll be looking up one band and, and the South by Southwest website will, will refer another one. And sometimes I just uh, wind up in a club to go see band A and it's like, well, band B doesn't start for another hour and a half. So, uh, you know, somewhere else. So I might as well stick here and watch the next band or go straight to that club and watch the band before. Right. So there's these in between acts. And sometimes that serendipity really is what what works out. So. uh so I, there's a couple of bands I wanted to talk about uh, that I saw. The The highlight of the trip for me was a band called The Texas Gentleman. And these guys, um, I, man, like it was two guitars, two keys, bass and drums. And, you know, playing their own tunes. Every band that I'm going to talk about here was playing their own songs unless unless I say otherwise. But uh, like these guys can really, really play like serious and they can sing they've got great harmonies it was it was kind of um man what's the what's the way to to say it? i don't i don't even know how to describe it uh but it, like just good it like americana kind of music but it was like prog americana almost it it like they had like that swagger of of a texas band but the the Prague events of of like yes songs at times, wow. yeah, like and they all were right on the money. And then harmonies like power pop style harmonies where they just like jumped out and locked in. And these guys could play and sing, and they were having a blast huh. doing it. Hey, you, let me ask you a question about yeah. South by bands. Yeah. Every band in every venue is curated. No band is just just uh, coincidentally getting a gig in Austin during South by. Right. There's a reason every single band you saw yeah. was invited to play at one of these venues at one of these showcases. That's right. Yes, exactly. Got yeah, they, they all, all get vetted. Um, yep. They're all original bands trying to break through, except for the uh, Mr. Jimmy. Yeah, right. Yeah. There, there will be those those sort of you know, one off things. But yeah, by and large, it's it's people just looking to kind of, you know, further their craft and get in front of uh, audiences. And the cool part is like the audiences are into this. So 
the bands that, get, that go play down there. I mean, it was, you know, really refreshing to go. Uh, and this is true every year. But, you know, to go to these clubs that are mostly packed clubs, seeing these bands playing for people that are like me, never heard the band before, never, uh, you know, it just like never heard the music that just there to, to, you know, so absorb. Yeah. yeah. And, and these bands all, by and large, everybody plays a 40 minute set and all the sets start on the hour. So you play 40 minutes and you got 20 minutes to get off the stage. Somebody else gets on the stage and they start right at the top of the hour. And like almost without fail, I think I can count one scenario where I saw things running a little bit late, but otherwise, man, they keep this stuff like clockwork. And so, you know, even if it's a band that, if you, you know, you wind up watching a band, you realize, oh, this isn't really my cup of tea or whatever. It, there's now there's only 35 minutes left. Right. Because it takes you five minutes to figure out whether you like them or not anyway. Mm-hmm. And and now there's only 35 minutes left and they are like in it and putting their best foot forward, their best material. You know, they're stoked to be there usually. And uh, and, it you know, it, it so there's always something redeeming, even if. I would probably never choose to listen to any given band again. Right. You know, it's always, it's only 30 minutes that you are sort of having to, to deal. Um, but the Texas gentlemen, I had no idea who they were. I, they were not on my list. I had gone to a club to see Steve Earl. He played, I think he played the 10 o'clock set at this club sets run until, until 1am. So, you know, midnight is, Oh no, sometimes they run till 2am. Uh, but either midnight or 1am is the last slot. And, uh, and that was the last band of mine that I had on my list for the night. And I was going to go back to my hotel or whatever. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm standing right just before I walked out of the club. It was a packed club. I had to use one of my, you know, you get with your badge, you get some special passes that you can sort of sign up for to cut the line in certain scenarios. And so I had to use one of these to, to get in to see Steve Earl, which was fine. I'd planned for it. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm about to leave this club. I can't get back in. Um, uh, you know, who's next? And so I just on my phone, I pulled up, you know, look at the club, look at the thing. It's a Texas gentleman. I read the description. I'm like, all right, this sounds interesting. This is worth waiting now 15 minutes for them to start. You know, I'll, I'll listen to their first tune. Like, yeah, I was hooked. So, yeah, it was <laughs> it was, a, it was definitely a serendipitous moment. Um, it is humbling what kind of talent that is out there, isn't it? It's great. It's inspiring is what it is. It's like, oh, look at this. Like these guys are doing this and and they're making it happen and they're into it. And, it, you know, like and they're able to, in, you know, engage and entertain a crowd of unknowns. I mean, it's receptive unknowns, but, you know, still. What was their strategy? So, you know, you go prog rock that kind of implies longer songs, but you've only got a 40 mm-hmm. minute set. So what did they do? No, these weren't these weren't prog rock songs they just had prog rock elements uh in them like little you know little like you know moments syncopated lines yeah exactly yeah little kind of things where they would turn things around in a strange way or or whatever but um but yeah they by and large they were you know they were playing like pop songs i mean they were they were in that jam band realm like i could see these guys doing very well joining the jam band circuit you know and playing you know a festival like like a bonnaroo or or those types of things where you've got lots of different bands and everybody's just going to hear bands that just want to play you know cuz these they have guys have music on play. iTunes yet yeah yeah they've got an album out and so you can go check it out yeah yeah they but they they have an interesting history like they were just you know, hold up in a studio and would back up like uh, people like Leon Bridges and, and stuff. And then Chris Christofferson um, asked him to play the Newport Folk Festival with him. And uh, and that sort of started that. That was the thing that got them out of the studio and and uh, and playing live. So which, you know, and it's South by. Thing. So these guys are on, you know, the same stage as Steve Earl is on. So that's going to yeah. be one of the better clubs. There, I'm sure there are smaller, really upstart um, venue. Yeah, the, all the venues right? are really small. This is not a big venue, man. It's we. I know it's weird. You say Steve Earl and you think, oh, holy crap. Like, that's huge. But no, I mean, this place, it was Mohawk outside. It, it, you know, big enough to hold people, but not like you're not talking about a big place. This is just a bar. It, you know, Got like it. like any other bar. Yeah, Got yeah, it. yeah. Way, way smaller than like Broadway studio where we played, you know, with mm. the all star, like like a quarter that size. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the beauty of South by is when you, you know, you see these people that can play. It's like, oh, they're right there, you know, and the same with Red Volcare. I mean, that was at the Saxon pub, which is, you know, tiny a pub. 
It's just yeah. a pub. It's just a pub. That's it. I've played there. It's it's not a it was and it wasn't a big deal when I played there. You know, it's just like <laughs> oh, another gig. But you know, I've seen fastball there. I've seen I see red there every year. You know, like it's an Austin staple, so people will play it, kind of thing. Right. That's cool. Um, another band that was interesting. Uh, it was called Reptalians. I went to see them based on their name alone. I had uh, what I do is I just go through the you know I, like I said the press releases whatever it is. And I just mark any band that seems even remotely interesting. So at any point in the day, I might have like three things that I could go see uh, because I don't think about it in terms of when these people are playing. I just put them on my schedule. And then on the day of, I just look and say, "Okay, well, where where should I go next? And so I decided to go see Reptalians next. They were, you know, kind of poppy band the way they were described. They were they were good. They were really weird. Like they started the set. They had this guy with like a lizard head come on stage <laughs> and a robe. And he was sort of speaking along to a recorded track. It was it was it was bizarre, but it it gave them a very uh, unique, you know, shtick. And and having a unique shtick wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It got everybody in the club to pay attention. I mean, the guy next to me asked me if I had roofied his drink, but, you know, that that's fine. Um and uh, I hadn't, by the way, of Thank course. You. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but um, then it turns out he, he worked for Guinness. Uh, so so he wound up buying me beer. So that was nice. You know, so there you go. And I don't think he roofied mine either. But um, but it was just one of these weird moments. But it, it you know, it bonded the, the crowd together. Right. Like now this guy and I met. I don't know that I mean, we probably would have talked to each other, but maybe not. You, you know, and, and so it like having a shtick was was sort of the takeaway for me from this was, huh. You know, the songs were fine. I, I probably would not have mentioned them on the show were it not for their shtick. So, you know, maybe it works a little bit to get some PR. Um, the next band that really blew me away is a band called Sleepwalkers. Uh, I think they're out of Richmond, Virginia. In fact, yeah, they are really fantastic band, like like serious power pop with brother harmonies. You know, that the the bass player and guitar player or guitar player and bass player, depending on how that was organized, uh, were, were our, our brothers and, you know, singing together. Mm. Uh, th there's always something magic when siblings, you know, sing together and, and they yes, really, definitely. really had Coffice brothers. Yeah. Right. And these, but these guys could play. And then their lead guitar player was just crazy in a good way. Very energetic on stage, kind of like a young Keith Richards. Mm. He had that kind of vibe. Vibe, swagger. Yeah. yeah, that swagger. Exactly. And, and I, and their songs were just fantastic, like really good, you know, heavy power pop stuff. So, and you know, I'm, I'm into that. And I had done like, I think I'm going to mention another band that was power pop maybe as we go through here, but uh, you know, I will ser search through and filter by certain things. Like I will search for prog bands to see if there's anything. Uh, obviously I didn't stumble onto the Texas gentleman that way. I don't think they're categorized that way, but you know, I'll, I'll look for stuff that I know is, uh, you know, of interest to me. I, I saw some jazz bands cause I looked for jazz. I, I saw some power pop bands cause I looked for power pop. And then it was like, oh, this looks interesting. I'll go. I'll go to that. You know, um, I saw two UK bands back to back, one called Halos and one called Mink, M-I-N-K-E. And Halos is H-A-E-L-O-S. But it's really hard to search for because they, they use that one letter that's the A and the E together, which is oh. cool, cool, except <laughs> but I'll put links in the show notes <laughs> to them all. It was really hard to find them in the app. Like, I, I know they're playing somewhere else. How do I do this? I Actually, the way I had to find them in the South by Southwest app was to go to a club where I knew they were playing and then like link through from there. Cause I couldn't figure out how on my phone's keyboard to type that stupid character. But anyway, um, Halos female singer, um, four piece band, female singer, uh, guitar player who was also a, a singer. There were times where he did not play guitar. He just sang a keyboard player who, who also played the bass lines and then a drummer and it really was like live band EDM. It was it was this, you know, electronic dance music style thing, but with a live band playing it. There was no pre-recorded tracks or anything, you know, mm -hmm. and it was um, they were fantastic, like really blew me away. And it's that's, you know, another one of those things where not the kind of band that I would, um, you know, choose to turn on or or whatever. It's just not not the sort of thing that that usually appeals to me, but again, they were 
dug in and really playing and, and great melodies um, and just great energy on the stage, uh, which, you know, means a lot. Uh, and Mink, Mink was interesting. Mink, uh, another UK band. So Halos is from the UK and Mink's also from the UK. And uh, a female fronted band guitar player, uh, the, the singer uh, was a guitar player and really good guitar player, uh, like took these leads that just blew me away. And that was more power pop y kind of stuff, uh, but also really good and uh, just, you know, had had a good vibe to him and, and knew how to engage a crowd. Uh, and that man that like especially I saw this one band. I didn't have them on my list. They were called the Beths um, and they had some some buzz, you know, like I went to see them because I'd heard things about them. Great songs. But as the woman standing next to me said, she turned to me and she's like, they look like their parents are forcing them to do this. Uh, it, you you got to bring it in that in that. I mean, you got to bring it every night. But I mean, I got to imagine if you're amongst a bunch of bands that are trying to break through that got a coveted invitation to, to perform and showcase at South by you got to bring it. And this was I, a I would imagine you'd have house. to be. Yeah. yeah. Packed. I mean, if your vibe is that kind of like <laughs> that disinterested <laughs> Charlie mm. Watts right thing, you better be damn good at that vibe and very, very, very subtle. And your music better, you know, find some way to amplify or echo, you know, yeah. your vibe. But, yeah, but that's a risk, right? So it's, it's a huge risk. It was just weird. I, it, I, it almost like I looking at the singer, but everybody on stage was sort of the same way. Looking at the singer, I think they're from Australia. So maybe they'd had rough travel or whatever, but still like, hmm, you know, it's 40 minutes. Like, just forget about that for a little bit. Um, but, I, you know, looking at it, it was like I my thought to myself was it looks like as she was walking on stage, somebody said, hey, look, I got to let you know your dog died. You know, oh, and gosh. it was like she had that kind of a look like like yeah. this vacant kind of like I, I don't want to be here. I've got something else I need to deal with. And maybe that was true. Right. I mean, you know, obviously life happens at the times when we least want it to sometimes, right. you know, so maybe that is what happened. But uh, it yeah, it was and it was a it was a Rolling Stone showcase too. It was a huge club and it was packed with people much bigger club than where I saw Steve Earle, like twice the size of that. And it was just wall to wall people. So anyway, yeah. I will say this, though. The MVP of the week was Nord, uh, the keyboard company. I saw yeah. more Nord keyboards than any other single brand. And, of course, Nord did a really good job with, with their branding ideas years ago because every one of their keyboards is bright red. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But I saw Nord's. And then, like, number two was Moog, believe it or not. I saw a ton of, like, those Moog ones, like the, the sort of all-in-one, you know, uh, portable Moog keyboards uh, sure. at the event. Um, and then the guy from the guy from the Texas gentleman had a, he had a, um, it was similar to the Moog. It was an analog synth, you know, but it wasn't Moog. It was some other brand. And I, it's, it escapes me, but anyway, so Nord was, Nord was ubiquitous as they, as they should be. They make great keyboards. So, um, and then of course I got back from South by Southwest and went to, um, the stone church on Saturday night and uh, my friend, our friend Dave Brunyak played now. Oh, yeah. yeah. We talked to Dave years and years ago, uh, right as he had joined a band called pink talking fish, which is for those of you that hadn't heard the interview, don't know. That's a band that covers pink Floyd, the talking heads and fish sometimes simultaneously. Like they do a really good job arranging these tunes and they've always prior to Dave joining the band, they'd always had, sort of a rotating slot for their guitar player. They would bring somebody in for three months and, and at a time Dave had just, uh, sort his of, tour of duty. Yeah. Well, no, he had, he had just started his tour of duty. Yeah. But he, he had just broken up. Um, the, the band that he had was called the freaks, which is a fish only tribute band. And he's a, he's a fantastic guitar player, obviously really into Tran Anastasio and, uh, from fish. And so he'd had this band and that's how he and I met because he was sort of looking to reform it. And we had played together a couple of times with that in mind. And then he got this call from PTF to to join them for a stint. Well, that stint lasted like three years because he was perfect for that band. Um, and they did extremely well, like they blew up. They went from playing a club like the Stone Church, which is, you know, 100, 150 people or whatever to 
you know, selling out thousand seat venues all over the country. Mm. Yeah, they really they did a whole tour thing. And and Dave recently left them on his own terms. Things were uh, on the outside. Things were going well. It, it seemed like, you know, they were getting along and all that stuff. But he uh, he really wanted to further his original work. And he I and I want to get him back on the show to talk about this. But, uh, you know, he I think he realized he's made a name for himself. It, you know, he has some cachet in this jam band community right now because they've been mm-hmm. traveling all, all over the world. And it was like, OK, time to leverage that. And so he did two sets at the Stone Church. He put the, together this fantastic band, eight piece band, three horns, um, a trombone, trumpet and a, a saxophone player, uh, keys, drums, percussion, bass and him. And this band was, I mean, stellar players. It's rare. I, I go see bands. I mean, I saw a bunch of bands at South by Southwest. Right. And I loved many of them. I love Dave's band. But Dave's was the only band that I saw in, you know, the last two weeks. It's rare that I go see a band and say, oh, man, I wish I was playing with this band. You know, <laughs> it was like that kind of a thing. Right. Um, really, really. And their drummer was fine. It wasn't like I wish I was playing because no, 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 no. Their drummer was great. It was like, oh, this is like this is this is good stuff. And so his first set was all originals. Uh, he had done all the arranging for the horns and and uh, really did some cool stuff. And uh, he writes some really great songs and some great riffs and uh, and really kind of locks it all together. And then. Uh, I think to continue to, I mean, to do stuff he likes, but also to, you know, give the crowd something familiar. His second set uh, was all songs by the Trey Anastasio band. So people had, you know, something if they, if they weren't into his originals. Yeah. I, I actually really liked his originals. I, I talked to him at set break and I'm like, can we just have another set of that? You know, <laughs> but um, he's like, no, I get, I get to go have fun now and play Trey songs. I was like, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but uh, but really, you know, like an interesting thing, like taking this and and moving it to the next level, because I, unless you're Joe Cocker, right, you, you know, the, the cover band thing will uh, not you know, there, there's a limit to, to how far you can go, how much money you can make and all that stuff. There's good money. You can make money quickly. But if you want to actually play for bigger crowds and and, you know, open up that possibility, generally speaking, the original stuff is, you know, where that's going to happen. And I think he's got a he, you know, he has a I don't know if it's a unique opportunity, but it's a certainly an opportunity to leverage, you know, what he's done and bring people into this original thing for him. Uh, you know, it gives him a leg up, which is smart. So it's so. it's an interesting thing to think about the arc. Right. So what you just said is absolutely true. There's a general ceiling about where you're going to go financially. If you're a cover band musician, there is a longer road. If you're an original musician, totally that is fraught with poverty, (laughs) you know, it could be, Uh, yeah, it could be. Yeah. In general, fair. Mm, Maybe I, I I think if you're willing to go and, and tour, I think you can make decent money as an original musician, Mm. but, but we should dig into that because my, my, My optic into that is a little bit different, but it's also kind of interesting. Like the, the, the highest paid cover bands, at least in my area yeah. are often filled with guys who went out and did the original thing for a while. And, you know, they were touring musicians and, totally. and they're like, you know, I want to stay home. I want to stay and home. Like, yeah. yeah. No, that, and, that's uh, exactly you know, right. Yes. And I'll, you know, go, go play weddings and, you know, put X amount in my pocket and, you yep. know, go sleep in my own bed at night and that type of thing. So it's an interesting arc, you know, the, the cycle, the circle yeah. of life, right? Yeah. Well, it's, as soon as you prioritize being home over having a successful career as an original musician, um, well, then, then like, that's it. Th- those two things are almost at odds with each other a hundred percent of the time. I, I'm sure we can find, I would love to actually find and, and talk with someone who, who does both. Right. But by and large, if you're going to succeed as an original, you know, musician or band or whatever, you got to go out there, you got to go out and tour and hit different markets all the time. Not just Dave kind of was both because he took cover cover music out there. Right. Well, that was the thing. Yes. He took the cover thing with Pink Talking Fish. And he was uh, I don't when we talked to him, certainly he when he had just joined, he was, you know, Dave play guitar, you know, just like me with Dave bang drum. Right. He was just the hired gun. I don't know how much of that changed over the course of his you know multi-year tenure with them. But, you know, they have a system and and 
maybe nothing changed. Like maybe Dave was like, yeah, your system works. It struck me as a clearly savvy guy who totally who was very uh, purposeful in what he was, in the decisions yeah. he was making, even yeah. with, with, you know, playing with. So yeah, I think it'd be really interesting. Let's get him back and, yeah. and you know, see if we can pick his brain. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Hey, I wanted to share um, one thing. I've been meaning to do this for a couple of weeks. We, uh, in the early days of the show, we had a really nice guy named Steve Witchell on mm -hmm. uh, as a guest. And Steve hosts the Facebook community, a pretty large Facebook community called Cover Band Central. Um, they have some spirited debates go on over on their Facebook page if, if you're into that. That's a nice thing. way to say it. <laughs> yeah. As, as you would if you have X amount of thousands of, of musicians, you know, in one place at one time. But uh, Steve did a really cool thing. He wrote a little ebook called Cover Band Riches, all about his perspectives about, you know, know, what things that you can do to uh, leverage uh, your time as a cover band artist, as a cover, as a cover band. Uh, and so if you go over to cover band central, if you're on Facebook, you can find this ebook. It's, it's, you know, it's like nine bucks or 10 bucks or something like that. And um, there's just a couple of good tips in there. Steve's a really good guy. Um, he's very, very passionate about um, not only his own playing, he's a bass player in New Orleans, but he's also very passionate about helping musicians. Hence the, you know, the creation care and feeding of the cover band central community. But I like Steve a lot and he has some really interesting things to say. He was a great guy guess when we had him in our early days. So I just want to give a little plug and let you guys know about this ebook. It's a really quick read. It's, you know, 40, 50 pages and um, just some good tips in there. Some of the stuff is obvious stuff that we've been talking about, but there's, you know, all more information, the better. There's always something else to learn. So the cover band riches ebook is something I suggest that everybody take a look at. Oh, sweet. I'll put a link to it uh, right there in the show notes for everybody. Cool. I have, uh, speaking of tips, and I, I, we're basically out of time, but there's one little tip I want to share from listener Michael because I like sharing tips. And this was one of those things when he sent it in that just blew me away. Um, he, uh, he says his wife recently got a new job as an organist and choir director at a church. And they have a 10 voice choir that sings from the loft in the back of the church. The choir is mic'd, but they were using four audio technical lectern type mics with the singers all huddled around him. He says these mics were linked to the overall sound system wirelessly because the system was installed by an outside vendor and there was absolutely no way to adjust the levels on these mics. The only control was on or off. Mike was asked if he had a solution and he did. And it's just brilliant. He says he replaced the uh, audio technica mics with two sure PGA 27 set at a distance from the choir and uh, gave his wife an SM58 at the organs that he could mix her in as well. And the mics, he says, are all run through a tiny little Mackie mixer, one of those little compact mixers that has a switch for line and mic level output. And he also was able to set up a small monitor speaker over for his wife at the organ via the, you know, the uh, the mixer as well. The trick, he said, because, again, these mics were wireless. The trick, he says, is using two of the Audio Technica wireless units. So he detached them from the mics to send the output from the mixer to the system at the front of the house. So he's got a little mm -hmm. sub mixer that sub mixes all this stuff in the loft. And then because the sub mixer has XLR outs like you would on any microphone, he just took the wireless packs from the microphones, plugged them or the wireless extenders, transmitters, I should say, plug them into the mixer instead. Now he's got this stuff sub mixed up there. And wirelessly, it's sending it through to the front of house. And so he gets he gets to have his cake and eat it, too. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought using the wireless transmitters from a microphone on a sub mixer instead was just so brilliant that I wanted yep. to share because it's that's one of those things that, you know, I bring I have. I, in fact, I can see it right from here. I have this like tub. It's just a, you know, a plastic tub of stuff that I bring to every gig and most of the, and there's like a wireless transmitter in there. There's an extra microphone. There's extra adapters. Uh, I have a thing that can take a powered, uh, uh, powered signal that's supposed to be sent to a speaker and break it down to headphone level. If in case like somebody sending powered monitor to the stage and I want to use it for in ears, these are things that I've used maybe once every five years. But when you're in the moment and you have this stuff, it can save your bacon and his idea totally adds to that, that kind of concept of keep this in mind there, the day may come. So, you know, there, gear, uh, that, that concept of gear is an interesting thing in the same way that a digital mixer 
often for most of our, us cover bands uh, has allowed us to get rid of racks of heavy mm-hmm. stuff, right? You know, EQs for every channel, you know, effects and all that type of stuff. Um, and somewhat with, with digital technology, being able to do like a cat five, you know, yeah. from a, from a digital snake, that's all good, but really someday 90% of setup and 90% of teardown is cables, 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 damn yep. cables. Yep. You know, the day when we can have bulletproof, rock solid, wireless, everything, you know, just plug in and go is, is the, you know, that's the Holy grail. That's the dream. Literally, you know, it is how except much of your- power right now. Every cable you remove, you add a battery to the mix. That's true. Right. Yeah, or a, it, You or know, a, which is a, why, why as a drummer, I, I have no interest. I have a wire, a really nice, sure wireless uh, in-ear belt pack transmitter thing. I never use it because I'm not going anywhere. I just want, run a cable to my drums. I plug in. I never have to worry about a transmitter or a battery dying. So, yeah. Yeah. But I'm with you. Like th- there, there's a lot of stuff that if we could run it wirelessly without any notable latency would be awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We it's crazy. Be- we can dream. No, it's good to dream. I, what I really want is is true wireless in ears, right? Um, so that like 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 Apple's AirPods or you know oh, uh, something right. similar to that, right? That would be great. Where the, where the receiver is actually in the pods yeah. themselves. No cables. Like the cable no. coming down from my in ears is a constant <laughs> source of frustration for me, especially sitting because yep. sometimes it gets under my butt, you know, and it's like, oh crap! I just want to put stuff in my ears and not think about it. So. Um, anyway, we can dream. I've talked to dream. some, I've talked to some folks about this and they say that it's not impossible so that there, there's the dream right there. So, yeah. Well, All thanks right, for man. the filling on South by, I love hearing about those bands. I'm going to check a couple of them out, spe- cool. especially that te- Texas gentleman, Texas gentleman. Oh, so yeah. good. Yeah. So good. good. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I, I saw some other things at South by well, actually some companies that I want to mention because they're relevant to, uh, to us as musicians. So we'll talk about that next time, but for this, good. Time, we're all set. Feedback good up, Dave. at gigabpodcast.com. Good catch up on it too, man. This is great. Hey Dave. Yes, Paul. Please always be performing. Oh, such great advice. Such great advice. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>